dude, what the hell are you doing? Um, drinking your scotch. Came all the way up here, after all. Seriously? Um, yeah, what should I be doing? Uh, getting ready. For what? Our show with retired General Tony Tata. And what should I be doing for that? Oh, I got some ideas. First up, jumping jacks. Jumping jacks? You're serious? Whatever. He's all dead. All right, those were okay. Now we're gonna see how many push-ups you could do. That's not low enough. Oh, it's time for crunches. I dislike you with extreme prejudice. <laughs> That's how you feel about me? Well, guess what? We're going into the woods. Low crawl. What does this have to do with interviewing Tony Tata? Absolutely nothing. Our guest tonight is retired Brigadier General Anthony J. Tata. Tony served in the United States Army for 28 years. His last combat tour, he held the role of Deputy Commanding General of the 10th Mountain Division in the Joint Task Force in Afghanistan, where he commanded nearly 25,000 troops. Among his military decorations, he has been awarded the Combat Action Badge, the Bronze Star, and he served as a Master Parachutist and graduated from the U.S. Army Ranger School. He is listed as a distinguished member of the 502nd, 504th, and 505th Parachute Infantry Regiments. After retiring from the Army in 2009 with the rank of Brigadier General, Tony held several roles within the public education system before North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory appointed him as Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Transportation. After leaving public office, Tony joined the private sector, most recently as a regular contributor to Fox News. Tony's also an acclaimed novelist of 12 fiction novels, including national bestsellers, Foreign and Domestic, Three Minutes to Midnight, and Besieged. His newest novel, Double Crossfire, is ripped from the headline thriller with a premise sure to send chills down everyone's spine. Now, let's talk to Tony Tata. So the men of the crew are privileged to have as our guest tonight, retired General Tony Tata. Tony, Hello. thanks for being here with us. Hey, hey. Great, Tony. Great to be with hey, you guys. Thanks. Tony, cheers. <laughs> So I'm going, to, I'm going to start off tonight with a line of questions. Um, so with each subsequent Jake Mahegan novel, you really do a masterful job of ratcheting up the action, but at the same time, you keep Jake grounded, um, and he's really a believable character. So can you explain how you crafted him as a protagonist, and did you actually maybe blend um, some real-life soldiers you had or experiences you, seeing soldiers in action to create the character of Jake? Well, you know, I, I love uh, Jake Mahegan uh, as if he were one of my soldiers. And uh, the genesis of Jake came from when uh, my agent, Scott Miller, uh, gave me some, you know, very broad guidance as, as Scott uh, does. And he, and he said, give me, give me a loner, uh, you know, have him go into small town America and find a problem and save the day essentially and make <laughs> mm -hmm. him former, former uh, military. And I said, Oh, so like Jack Reacher, but different. And, and it's that old Hollywood saying be the same thing, only different. Yeah. Um, yeah. So being from Virginia Beach, uh, I drove down to the Outer Banks um, of uh, North Carolina, which is about an hour drive, uh, took my surfboard, and I started uh, mapping out uh, at, a, at a place down there. I just rented a place for a week, 
and uh, started sketching out uh, Jake's character because before I had any plot or any of that, I just wanted a character. And so I created this six and a half foot tall Native American from the easternmost point in North Carolina, a small town called Frisco on Hatteras Island. And he's uh, got this uh, troubled background where he was a little bit of a delinquent. Uh, when he was uh, 14 years old, he killed two men that uh, were attacking his mother. He lost his mother during that incident. And, and uh, he struggles with uh, memories of his father. And uh, Three Minutes to Midnight is all about him sort of reconcile, trying to reconcile mm-hmm. all of those demons. But uh, t- to me, uh, for, for Jake uh, to be a grounded, as you say, Eric, uh, believable character, I, I wanted him to be flawed uh, and yet uh, be driven to succeed. And one of the things that uh, always impressed me about so many of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, is that there is a sense of duty, this sense of mission that permeates and, and drives and continues to uh, uh, fuel them to, to do the right thing uh, for the right reason. And that's what uh, fuels Jake. And, and there's another thing, because of the way his mother was treated, uh, he, he has a very short uh, hair trigger, a very light hair trigger when uh, he sees men treating women badly. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that does not rest well with Jake, uh, <laughs> it. and uh, he, he uh, tends to uh, not overreact, but uh, to definitely react and react. Uh, enter, yeah. enter the fray on behalf of, of the woman. And, and it's interesting as his relationships with women have de- developed, uh, they've entered the fray on his behalf as well. So uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a great character. I love writing Jake. And, and I, I feel like uh, he's, you know, he's uh, my, you know, my best friend. Hmm. So he's almost like a real person. He, oh, definitely. Yeah. He's like an actor in my mind. Uh, when I'm writing, he's, he's taking me where he wants to go. I, I'll, be, I'll go places and, and uh, scenes that I'm writing that I hadn't really envisioned, but because Jake's there, uh, he's he's making the motion, uh, the movement happen. He's that uh, you know compelling force that is making something happen that I perhaps never even anticipated. Hmm. So, uh, so General, you've you've led our troops during war. You've mm-hmm. written stories about terrorist plots, death, murder, and destruction that span the globe. Um, so, it's safe to say, if you haven't seen it, you've thought of it for a story. So my question is, what keeps Tony Tata up at night? What's happening in the world right now that scares the crap out of you? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, mm. and, and if, you, if you've read all of my books, there's a little bit of a, I keep coming back to a touchstone of um, these ships and containers and, and drones are, are kind of a persistent theme. If they're not central, like in Besieged, they were central or yeah. Brett. Um, they're they're at least on the tangent and and uh, to me the the whole concept of uh you know the container uh delivery system that we have coming through all of our ports we oh, inspect yeah. maybe three or four percent of the containers coming into the country wow. and and um you know if in besiege one of the um part of the plot is to sink ships and shipping channels and think about that and uh, all the commerce that comes into all of our ports if you really wanted to impact the economy of the united states you could uh you know in, in the in besiege you use drones to attack these ships and sink them in the shipping lanes right and, right and and so nothing gets in nothing gets out and and what you do is you significantly impact trade by by a huge margin and uh, compel uh, you you upend uh, the the you know trucking routes the the shipping routes everything everything and spans people, from it. and people can't get what they need because yeah. we're so interdependent nowadays destroy so the right. economy essentially right. yeah very right. quickly yeah it, you you would se- severely impact it that's right. for sure yeah. and you don't even need you don't even need like the delivery system doesn't even need to reach the United States I mean it has to get close right. Right. And just, you know, so we, you know, our law enforcement apparatus can't actually even engage with it until right. it's too late. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. That that's I, been added to my, my, uh, 
<laughs> to your nightmare list? I will say, when I read Besiege, Tony, it scared me. That, that was just <laughs> well, the way good. you designed that. I'm and because it it's not that difficult. It doesn't seem like yeah. it would be that difficult to pull it off. And it was just like, wow, that's scary. But that one, I want to see. I want to see a movie out of that one for sure. It would. Yeah, be no, you know, I loved. Uh, I loved writing Besiege. Uh, the autistic eleven-year-old uh, girl Misha. Yeah. Um, is one of the central points of view mm -hmm. of that story. And I, I really did a lot of research on autism. My time as superintendent in Wake County, uh, we, we had uh, probably about uh, 12,000 students on the autism spectrum out of 150,000 in the system. And, and so I, I got to know the, the parents and, and the uh, leaders of uh, the autism societies of Wake County, North Carolina. And they actually read an early draft of it. And I said, tell me if I've got Misha close. And they gave me like, you know, five, 10 recommendations. And, and they, you know, he said, you know, you're 90% there. So that, that actually made me feel really good. Because That's pretty good. I, I did some significant research on autism and, and uh, that, uh, you know, uh, disorder as, and, and the, the publisher's weekly um, review, I, I was really proud that it said um, Tata treats Misha's autism um, not, not as a disability, but as a superpower. Yeah. And, and hmm. uh, that's really how I wanted her to, to deal with it. And then, you know, they picked, uh, Publishers Weekly picked that as a best book of 2017. So that, that really made me feel good too. Yeah, that's so, gotta be. Absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the writing itself. Um, one of my best friends is a Lieutenant Colonel down at, he's an XO down at Bragg. And, um, I know a little bit about how much writing, uh, a military officer has to do over the course of his career, um, whether it be in war college or just reports. Or, and I know a lot of that writing is drier than what you're writing right now. So I'm curious, what prep, how, how much of your preparation do you think you got from the military writing you had to do and how did it help you and did it in any way hamper you because it was such a different style of writing? Uh, that's a great question. I, I you know, they, the the one thing I think that really helped me was the training that we all got that a lot of people may or may not have paid attention to, but it was to write in active voice, not passive voice. Mm -hmm. And and I I always uh, thought that that was probably a seminal moment uh, for any military officer that's trying to do written communication because you can be so dry, so um, ineffective as a writer if you're simply writing in passive voice. But uh, to, to have that, uh, you know, active voice going and, and uh, you know, use those verbs correctly, uh, then to me, it makes, it drives the action better. And, and so that from my military training, and, and I hadn't really thought about it until just, just now when you asked that question. Um, but, you know, I, I, I never watched a whole lot of TV. And so during my military career, I would be down in my my office and i'd just be writing and 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 creating scenarios and thinking and really the more i read the more i said well you know i could make a story out of this or i could make a character out of that and i began writing and i began reading books on how to writing and sort of uh, tried to teach myself how to do it and uh, at the end of the day the combination of use an active voice and then uh, figuring out how to plot and 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 uh, write uh, from you know not not spending a whole lot of time watching TV and writing uh, you know really really helping. Yeah, well, um, you know, building on that, as a you know as 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 an Army general, you know, you had such an immense amount of uh, experience drawn to write policy books, strategy books, memoirs, you know really high level stuff. So where did you go wrong in your life that you went to thriller writing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I went wrong a lot of uh, my life. So I, we can talk about that all day. But, um, the, you know, uh, it always intrigued me. Um, there, there were really kind of two um, types of thinkers that uh, I, I typically um, interacted with in the military. Some were high level vision kind of people and some were very deductive thinkers that uh, you know would you know you're you're sort of your typical engineer that was thinking of you know your pert diagram and yeah. sequential and, and linear and and I always felt like 
I could do both. I wasn't real great at the sequential linear thing and I wasn't real great at just staying high level, but I felt like I was good enough at both the where that I could, I could think of the plan and then I could implement the plan and I could make sure that the logistics were moving in the right direction. And if I had the right team, I could uh, very simply um, lay out the plan and then, in, in, you know, embed with the team and, and understand what they needed to do and, and lead them and have the instinct to where the, the faults might be yeah. in that plan and try to put myself at that location, whether it was ammunition or transportation or, or, you know, that, you know, something tactically that was going to take place. And, and, and that from a, from a leadership standpoint, from a creative thinking standpoint, the military requires creative thinking every day, all day. Hmm. And, and, um, that's, that's one thing I think a lot of people don't understand is that the creativity required to be an effective leader in the military is, is immense. Hmm. So kind of taking jumping off that point, um, you know, there's some gifted people you'll hear about their background and it's not uncommon to hear, well, they went to West Point, um, uh, you know, a common bond there of it, the reputation for West Point graduates of just excelling. Um, what was it about West Point that you learned that shaped you really into the person you are? What's the the catalyst that you got out of there that, that, you know, made you the man you are now? Yeah. Well, um, you know, West Point uh, creates a, a couple of different types of people. You come out of there um, uh, either having figured out how to um, live within the system yet mm-hmm. make the, make the, uh, the rules, um, uh, such that, that you can uh, expand your horizons or you stay within those, um, very tight confines and, and, um, uh, perhaps you're not as creative as I was just talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I would say that I push the envelope a little <laughs> bit of that, um, uh, not, uh, not to say that, uh, you know, I did anything nefarious there, but uh, I, I did have fun when, when you weren't supposed to. And, uh, uh, and when it, when it, I, I guess the thing about West Point was the friendships I made there are, are lifelong. And I, I think that's true for, you know, lots of people that just go to, uh, you know, a, a, no, a normal college. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, given the, the discipline system and the regimentation, you get two weeks off every summer, you really learn to value your time, who you spend it with, how you spend it. And, and I think for me, being, you know, so busy writing two books a year, running a business, appearing on TV, it's when, when I decide to do something, that's, that's a full up commitment. There's no, there's no slack. And, and and by choosing to spend an hour or two with somebody, for me, that's a real conscious decision that I'm, I'm saying, this is something I want to do. And that I can trace that all the way back to my plebe year at West Point, where I had no time. I missed my friends terribly. I, I was, you know, eight hours away by car, you know, I was from Virginia beach living in on the Hudson river, freezing up there. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, it, it, it's tough I'm getting yelled at every day. Yeah, but, yeah. You shave your head. I was playing baseball and wrestling and trying to do everything I could. And I realized everybody was at least as good as me, if not better in those two sports and, <laughs> and uh, you know, up there at least. And, and you know that happens at at the collegiate level, right? So it's sure. sort of passed from every every state comes there, and you're like, wait, I'm no longer a state champion, yeah. or whatever. So, um, but it, it's really the the management of time and the friendships uh, that that you take away from there. I think so, what's, um, diff- yeah. what's different. I'm sorry, Chris. What's no. different about West Point, though, is yeah, th- mm-hmm. a lot of people are great athletes, the, but they're also the best students. They're also you know generally had to do something to demonstrate their character outside just to get in the place. Just to get so in. It's, it's yeah. A pretty extraordinary environment. Sorry, yeah, Chris, it's an awesome place. So um, you mentioned, you know, about your time that, you know, you're doing a lot of stuff, you're doing TV appearances and stuff. And so um, people may not know by your, the name on the book who you are, but I'm sure they've seen your face on television and you don't hide your political leanings. In fact, you're very, very vocal and appear regularly on national television 
shows to defend your, uh, your point of views. So what effect, if any, has your outspoken public persona had on your writing career? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure that I truly know the answer to that. I, I think that we're so divided um, today um, that, you know, I'm sure half the population may think I'm an idiot and the other half <laughs> may think I'm a hero. But, right. Uh, There's no in-between. No in between. No. It's just yeah, they're, one they're, or the other. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is um, I, I do try to uh, speak strictly from an analytical point of view and not from a political point of view. And you know, whether we're talking the Syria issue uh, all the way back to, I can remember three, four years ago about Bo Bergdahl and everything in between. I, I just tried to lay out uh, every time and, and I, you know, three, four times a week, I'm, I'm you know, I turned down an event tonight um, to, uh, for on uh, one of the networks and I was turned one down yesterday, turned one down today at lunch. So yeah. it, it's, I mean, I, I get them at least five, six a week, and I end up doing two or three a week just because, again, my time, I, I can't do it. But the the impact, I think, is that I, at book signings, I do have a lot of people that just show up because they've seen me mm-hmm. on, on TV. And, yeah. um, uh, and you know, of course, they buy the book and, and all that, so it helps with sales, I guess. That's a good and, thing. <laughs> that's what you want. And... You know, I, I think uh, where where I do most of my touring and and uh, you know it's a, it's a fairly receptive crowd, um, you know, throughout the the, the South and and so forth and and so I you know I I don't I, I'm just myself when I go on TV and, and right. I say what I believe and and people can think I'm crazy or they can think I'm I'm you know defending the truth and everything in between. And, and for me, it, it's, it's really, um, you know, they, they, the Fox, Fox news or CNN, um, they will show the book cover and say, you know, here's general Tata, the author of mm-hmm. textbook, double crossfire, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, you always see a little bump it, you know, it's not, not massive or anything, but you always see a little bit. Hmm. So I would, venture to say that a significant amount of military leaders maybe don't have the um, most, um, what am I trying to say? They're not really enthusiastic about the press necessarily, particularly (laughs) in the war zones. Um, You know, now that you're retired and you're in, you know, you're constantly on the, on the networks um, since retiring, has your opinion changed in one direction or another about the press in relation to the military um, now that you've, you know, you've, you've been on both ends of that stick? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really insightful question. The, the, you know, in, in the media, I would, or in the, in the military, I was always, uh, I always thought that embracing the press was a good thing, that embeds were, a good thing because they help tell our soldiers stories. Our soldiers are our best ambassadors for, for the military. And by and large, uh, when, when you have that relationship with the media, they, um, it's a shared experience and they're, and they tend to report out, um, in a more uh, accurate fashion than using some Northeastern liberal preconceived notion, um, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> not, not yet political. Or anything, but, um, uh, and, and so, uh, as you know, as a senior officer, even when I transitioned into city government as a DC public schools chief operating officer or county government as Wake County uh, public school superintendent, that's the 15th largest system in the country, 150,000 students or Jeez. secretary of transportation for North Carolina. I mean, I was in the, you know, the, the trenches every day with the media. Yeah. And, and you know, there, what the transition was very interesting as, as a military officer, you're somewhat um, shielded from scrutiny uh, because, you know, you're over, you know, conducting combat operations or whatever. And, and to the extent that there's, you know, it's all business as usual, there's really not a whole lot of scrutiny as, as a public leader in a city or a county or a state government. Um, and particularly dependent upon which party you're in, 
um, and you know, or, or that you work for, uh, you're you're um you're a ripe target as a retired flag officer <laughs> and, and um so and, and particularly if you have the potential to ascend to some kind of position of influence uh, yeah whether that be congress or you know whatever um you know there's there's snipers in the trees and the media uh, then takes on a, a role um quite frankly, outside the bounds of, of really just kind of reporting yeah. and, and opining. And, and uh, they, they, they take on a role of, um, you know, go, going after people to help shape the political environment, which uh, for better or worse, that's where we are. And, yeah. and uh, so that's, I think that's, that's sort of what's led us to where we are now where you've got that, uh, you know, it's trench warfare right now between <laughs> one side and the other. And yeah. most of us are caught in the middle in that beaten zone. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to duck and, and stay on <laughs> cover. <laughs> right. Um, you said something when you were talking about West Point that I just want to follow up on. You were talking about, you know, having two weeks in a summer and being yelled at and the routine and the discipline that anybody that knows anything about West Point knows comes with. Um, so I'm wondering how that, I talked about the mechanics of your writing, but how does it manifest itself in your routine as a writer? Now that you, I mean, you, you've lived a life of, you know, a routine uh, in the military of some, some way, shape or form. How does right. it manifest in your writing? Yeah. Well, I, I rebelled a little bit against that routine. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I write to stay on target, particularly doing two books a year. Uh, I have to write a thousand books a day or a thousand books, a thousand <laughs> words a day. And, and um, I, I have a Sergeant major with whom I served in the 82nd airborne division. And he used to say, sir, if we're not getting ahead, we're falling behind. And that is absolutely true. Yeah. There's no stasis. If you're not writing a thousand words a day, that's your, it's like a pick six. That's a thousand words you lost and you'll never make it up. And unless you write 2000 the next day. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, so a thousand a day, you know, in a hundred days, you have your average length thriller book, uh, if, if you're doing that and that's a thousand real, you know, good words, which could take you yeah. 2000 words to write. So, right. um, but that, that discipline, uh, emanates from, you know, a little bit from sort of how, how I was trained and a lot from just the motivation, my love for writing and, and creating and, and wanting to, um, deliver a an awesome book to you know the, my readers. So you don't wake to Reveille and start writing at five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I haven't heard Reveille in a long time. Uh, PTSD uh, with that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, I, I used to I used to hear it on the uh, Naval Observatory every day with the vice president. Uh, it's where his residence is. But uh, I'm still amazed that you you're writing two books a day, doing all the the TV stuff and and you know, running a business. I think that, I mean, two, two books a year. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's insane. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it I'm is. On deadline <laughs> for late January. I just signed a new deal with uh, Sam Martin's press and uh, awesome. Wow. And, nice. And uh, so I, I I'm uh, creating a new character, a new, a new um, uh, story and everything. So it, it's fun. Actually, it reminds me of, you know, back in 2014, 15, when I created Jake, I'm, I'm building a new character now and, and uh, doing a lot of research. I, I do need to get to the Outer Banks and go surfing. I'll, I'll use that as an excuse. to get. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, but you, you, you obviously clearly love that. Just even jump into a new project must be pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I am very excited. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to Gary Goldstein, my editor at uh, mm -hmm. Kensington, and I'm very grateful to Mark Resnick, my editor at um, St. Martin's Press, and uh, both great teams. And uh, you know, I I you know work with Mark on the Reaper series, and and he wanted uh, he wanted to take me solo uh, within uh, St. Martin's Press. So that's mm -hmm. um, you know I, I'm very excited about that. Nice. So talking about the books, and you know, we we mentioned Besiege earlier, which was one of those stories that. Again, I, probably out of all your books, I don't know why I want to say favorite, but to me, it was the one that was just scared me the most of like, this mm -hmm. is easily possible. But now you come out with Double Crossfire and Double Crossfire to me is 
very much ripped from the headlines and with just the contentious election we just went through, it's like, I, I could see something like this happening or, you know, I would surely hope it wouldn't happen. But um, <laughs> given where we are politically, given the divisiveness, um, where is it that you look for when you want to come up with the plot for whatever will follow up double crossfire? Where, where's that coming from? How do you decide what the next, you know, where Jake, or whether it be another character, wh where they're going to go? Yeah, Double Crossfire is an interesting um, story. Uh, my my editor Gary Goldstein said, uh, "Make make Cassie uh, more prominent in this book." And mm. uh, which you know, for those that uh, will be watching this and haven't read all of my books, Cassie uh, eventually evolves into a love interest uh, for Jake and is the first female graduate from U.S. Army Ranger School. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, in Dark Winter, Jake and Cassie um, get into the mix in Iran, and and uh, there's you know something left hanging there, and then that picks back up in Double Crossfire, and I had to find a way to still make Jake prominent because that's what my readers anticipate, and then also elevate Cassie, and I get a lot of good feedback on Cassie. Uh, I think my readers really enjoy her. And uh, so uh, it was a way of sort of having a yin and yang between Jake and Cassie. And, and the first thing I look for in a plot is where are, where's, what's a situation and environment that my protagonist uh, can excel and, and create a really compelling narrative. And, you know, I, I was thinking, about uh, you know, when when you look at the life cycle of a of a book, you got to turn it in about a year ahead of time, and so right. the, you know I was writing this thing. You know, you're writing it 18 months ahead of time if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, true. And and even 18 months ago, the the um, political environment, you could just see where it was going. It was hardening. It was ossifying. It was dividing. It was separating like two tectonic plates, so moving apart. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of where we are in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I also um, didn't believe, you know, that there's like 9-11's a touch tone in our life. This special counsel report thing, I think, right now and then maybe in the future is going to be a touchstone, uh, whether or not impeachment happens. I mean, it's, it's, it's only happened a few times to a few presidents. Right. And, and so I wanted to address sort of that divisiveness and, and as a soldier, uh, what, and you get thrust into that, how do you handle that? And, and, uh, what, you know, your, your sworn duty, as I talked earlier, is to defend the country against enemies, foreign and domestic. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and so in double crossfire, uh, you know, Jake and, um, Cassie are in a situation where there's, you know, there's a plot to take out the the first three levels of government, or or the first uh, three in the line of succession: the president, vice president, the speaker, mm -hmm. so that the Senate pro tem can then become the president. And yeah. um, uh, you know, so and I I thought that would make an interesting uh, plot to uh, drive toward a finale to drive toward whether or not that happens, how they make it happen, and then how two soldiers might uh, inject themselves into the situation to uh, spare the country from that, from that happening. Well, let's stick with the real life thing for a second here. So um, irregardless of who's in the, in the white house, what parties in the white house, what administration is there, what's the frequent thing that you've seen over time that the general public gets wrong uh, when it comes to uh, our country's strategic military policy overseas? Wow. Um, what the general public gets wrong. I, I think what the general public gets wrong, and I don't want to uh, speak on behalf of people because I think they get a lot right, but um, if there was one thing, it, it would be that it used to be there was a lot, a, a lot of trust, a sort of blind faith that the administration was doing the best it could to, to secure the interests of the nation. There's a national security strategy. 
and that uh, there's a whole framework there, uh, mm -hmm. architecture, people trying to make that happen um, and secure our interests, uh, uh, you know, uh, domestically and abroad. And, and uh, there are a lot of people that put a uh, blind faith into that. Um, now I don't believe that's the case anymore. And, and so I, and I think with social media, it's actually made it worse, uh, with, uh, the, this ossifying of, of, um, uh, opinions and differences and the, um, just the shouting that happens on Twitter and, and, and yeah, other places. Yeah, no and, and you can no longer, um, you know, you know, everybody's a criminal, you know, for example, you know, yeah. it's like arrest them all. You know, it's, right. And, 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 uh, you know, good public servants um, are being scared away right now. Oh, right. And, right. Absolutely. And, and it's, and it's, it's a casualty of this conflict that we have in the um, country right now. It's that people who could serve our nation well um, are, or, um, it's like they don't want to touch that hot. Why would they put or, themselves through that? Yeah. Right. Well, I, just, I mean, just look at the current administration. We have so many acting heads of department, right, and, and so many so many political positions that are not filled just because no one is going to step forward because they view it as as a career killer. Because you're going to yeah. get, you will be vilified, whether whether you're right or wrong, or you support or don't support, right. you'll be vilified, and and you'll almost, you know, tarred and feathered and it'll stay with you. Well, well not only that, you'll be destroyed financially because yeah, right. Right. Yeah. you've got, um, you know, all these groups uh, suing people and, and the intent is to make it uh, impossible to serve and then, uh, you know, wait, pray, hope for some kind of change and then to anticipate that, you know, the other side won't act just as crazy as the other side is. So, <laughs> of course right. they are. <laughs> uh, right. And so, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know where we go from here. I, I'm really, it's like uh, we're, in a, we're in a canoe about to head over the falls if we have <laughs> our, 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 the, um, you know, uh, fallen. And, and uh, we're just suspended in midair right now waiting to, for impact to see if there's rocks underneath us. Yeah. Or, oh, jeez. Uh, Hello. Water. Uh, Sadly, that's a perfect analogy. Well, well, well you know the, uh, the the world is the world is a dangerous place. Uh, hopefully, um, in Double Cross Fire, um, yeah, there's it's violent. You know, violence happens, and hopefully that doesn't happen domestically. But um, and it, it, it'd be re remiss of me if I didn't ask you. You know, we have you on with us about what's going on in Turkey and Syria. Sure. And I'd, I'd just like to hear your 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 input. You know, the Russians and the, and the Turks have now gotten together and they're going to secure the um, like a, a buffer zone where the Kurds were between Syria and Turkey. Right. Um, and it's because of, a, a you know, a vacuum. And I could be wrong. You know, when, when America mm -hmm. steps back, a vacuum ensues and it's going to be filled. And usually it's by our enemies. And so I just wanted to get, you know, your point of view of, of what's happening yeah. over there. Yeah. So. It's a super complex situation, as, right. as you just laid out. And um, I did three shows, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, uh, the Sunday show for about seven, eight minutes. And, and, and what I said there is, first of all, we need dispassionate analysis. We need um, analysis. We don't need hyperbole. We don't need emotion. We don't need tribalism. Uh, what we need to do is take a look at what we said we were going to do and, and what uh, what we've done and and where what our national security strategy says, and then uh, assess what's happening based on that. And so when you look at that, we said we were going to send in some troops to help um, defeat ISIS, and mm -hmm. and then uh, we were going to pull out. And ten months ago, the president said he wanted to leave Syria, and um, you know, I, and I'm getting a knock on the door from the hotel <laughs> room right now, so. Um, <laughs> But um, the uh, as we as we have our troops in there, we are um, at a point that if if we don't use this this point in time to extract ourselves from from this situation, um, we we could end up there for like we've been in Afghanistan for eighteen nineteen 18 years. years. Yeah, and and you know that. People say, well, we were in Japan or Germany or whatever. Well, I mean, you know, the Marshall Plan and all that stuff, that's a whole different deal. And, and you know, our, our quote-unquote allies, the Kurds, 
you know, we fought with the Kurds as an indigenous force in that area. Um, and it was a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And right. uh, they were expanding and solidifying um, their hold on what they want to call Kurdistan. And uh, they were helping us defeat ISIS, which was inside the land that they want to they want to own. And yeah. they so they wanted to kick terrorists out of the land that they consider theirs. And so the, they're the mountain Turks, as they're called in Turkey. There's 20 million Kurds in Turkey. That's, that's, that's 25 percent of the population, roughly about 83 million people in Turkey. Jeez. 20 million of them are, are Kurds, what the Turks call mountain Turks. And so from Turkey's geopolitical standpoint, what they're looking at is the, the Kurds are trying to use the umbrella of American protection to redraw international boundaries. And so when you, when you look at it from that direction, if we're going to redraw the international boundaries for Kurdistan, you got to do that in Turkey, Syria, okay. Iraq, Iraq, Iran, and Armenia. Jeez. And, and I don't, I'm not a bed man, but, I, you know, if somebody said all, all five of those countries are going to come to the table and be okay with the plan, <laughs> I would, I would lay a money, a lot of money down that that's not actually going to happen. Uh, and, so and let the so, Russians uh, spill some treasure and blood and let them get their. Yeah. It, and I it. mean, the Russians are already in Syria. I don't know right. what everybody's freaked out about. Uh, yeah. you know, but, I mean, they, they have a Navy base in Syria and, and Latakia. I, you know, so I don't, I don't understand what, and, and it's all just kind of this micro information that people are seizing on when they truly don't understand the whole geopolitical reference. You know, the one thing that concerns me is the potential land bridge from Iran into Syria into then lean on uh, Israel but it's kind of already there, and the, and Iran's already so embedded in Iraq that that's mm -hmm. kind of already there too. So that's yeah. a little bit of a straw man. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, for for me, the uh, do I want U.S. soldiers in the middle of uh, this land dispute that's happening between the Kurds, the Turks, uh, the Syrians, and potentially Iraqis, Iranians, and, and the Armenians? No, I don't. Uh, and and for all the people who said, well, we should have kept our troops there on the border because they, you know, they either would have been a, um, you know, deterrent or they they could have been a, you know, a, a force that uh, could have fought. Uh, think about that. You know, so the United States is going to fight a NATO ally. <laughs> and it's bizarre. And I'm, sure, I'm sure the headlines for Trump would have been great on that, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, of course. Trump goes to war with NATO. Oh. And and so it, it was really kind of a no-win situation. And I think the, the prudent move was to pull out. And, and people, you know, again, quoting our, you know, our allies, the Kurds and all that, uh, you know, it's, it, it these were, uh, we have no formal agreement with uh, the Kurds. We do have a formal NATO agreement with the Turks. The Turks were coming across the border. We needed to move our troops out of the way. And, and we still have troops with the Kurds in, in uh, Syria. So it's, it's not like we abandoned them. We, we repositioned and they're repositioning. And that's my viewpoint. And there are a lot of people that disagree. with me. Well, there's a lot of people just seizing on whatever bits that they want for their own Right, their, yeah. their own ones. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, <laughs> take you back, back in time. Uh, I've hit West Point a few times, obviously. So, but I want to know either your and you can choose any of these topics. Your best, <laughs> craziest, most stressful, or most bizarre West Point anecdote. Pick oh, bizarre. Uh, pick bizarre. <laughs> bizarre. Bizarre. Pick bizarre. bizarre. <laughs> pick crazy. Pick crazy. <laughs> it's all crazy. Um, so we used to, um, there was a water tower, uh, up near Mikey stadium. And in the springtime, uh, we had these mesh laundry bags, right? And I, I don't know if they'll, I'll, they'll come back and kick me out and revoke my, <laughs> my <laughs> I don't blame you guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's always, it's like, always uh, Eric's fault. Um, yeah. Uh, <sighs> but, uh, we would we would sneak some beer um, from, <laughs> from some undisclosed location, mm, <laughs> right. put it in the laundry bag. Um, 
and then put it in a green bag so you couldn't see the beer. And we carry it like we were just some cadets on a Saturday going up to go <laughs> hiking Carrying your ruck. after sure. class. And we would um, – crawl under the fence of the, it was a water tower. And it's not one of those that starts out narrow and then mushrooms up. It was just straight up, but it was pretty high. And, you know, in the springtime, it, you know, it was, it was nice. And we wanted to start working on our, on our base tan um, <laughs> before, before we got our big two week break. And um, so we would climb up, there were three of us and we would climb up there and we would, open up and this was the drinking water for west point and we would wo- open up the, <laughs> oh the um, uh, top of it and it had a had a it, for, for whatever reason the lock wasn't on it and <laughs> and we you could climb down in it and we would tie the, the water was freezing and you could tie the uh we we would tie the mesh bag off and it would keep our beer cold nice. <laughs> and uh ingenuity so, yeah. and, and so then we would you know lay out what else do you do right yeah. and, and um and and uh and then when you got hot you of course you would climb in and you would go swimming in the, in the drinking water, water. The oh drinking my water. gosh and, um, so hmm. that's um that's probably uh it, we actually got caught doing that but um without the beer thank thank oh, thank god oh, yeah. and, and um you know, I, I think that's they've got a much stronger fence around that thing now, and they have a lock on the top. I mean, probably it works. Did you have Did you have hours after that? Um, yeah, just a few. You know, I, I didn't, I, you know interestingly, I, I didn't. I didn't walk a whole lot of hours. I, I mean, I didn't get caught doing a whole lot of stuff. Um, but uh, you know, I, I did. I did have to walk some. And um, I, I, I valued my free time so much that I made sure I didn't do Lose anything to, that go. would result in that. Or I, if, if I did, I made sure I, I, I did everything possible not to, not to be um, obvious about it. <laughs> so as the, the, the young man who climbed the water tower to store his beer, to lay out, to then years later, you are the deputy commanding general of the 10th Mountain Division in Afghanistan in charge of 25,000 troops. Um, what was your proudest moment there when you led those, the, 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 those men and women in Afghanistan? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, just so proud of, um, we, we had, um, I want to say about 25,000 troops on the ground and, mm-hmm. um, Iraq had about 200,000, somewhere in the mm. high 100s. Um, mm. Afghanistan was uh, one third larger landmass, 8 million more people than Iraq, um, infinitely harder terrain, and infinitely less uh, developed from an infrastructure standpoint. So it, it was a PhD level problem and order of magnitude. And, and the commitment of, of soldiers uh, to um, uh, absolutely take care of the Afghan citizens and be good representatives and ambassadors for the United States uh, was just immeasurable. I, you know, it really was. And every day they used to have a saying that if you want to get shot, go with General Tata. Because you know, <laughs> I, I would go uh, in in my helicopter. Um, we, you know, we were all over the place and we, you know, I would go into those areas and I would grab a couple of staff officers out of the, out of the, um, you know, Bagram air base, you know, uh, building there uh, where the HQ was. And we would go visit troops on the, uh, you know, quote unquote front lines and, right. um, got into some dust ups, uh, doing that. And, and, uh, I guess my most proud moment would be when, uh, we went to the corn gall Valley on one of those, uh, visits and I had promised uh, Doug, uh, not Doug Sloan, but um, uh, Jimmy McKnight, uh, company commander there, that I would bring uh, these bags of too many soldier letters from the USO. And it was Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I said, Look, I'm going to spend uh, Christmas Eve in your Ford operating base. You know, that's what every 
every captain wants is a general in his <laughs> um, <laughs> night. Great. Um, yeah. And, right. <laughs> and and um, so we get fogged out, snowed out. And then the, the next, uh, I tell my aide, all right, New Year's Eve, let's go. Because, you know, it's a tough time when you're away. You're, mm-hmm. you're yeah. out there. You hadn't had a shower in months. And, and you're, you know, in foxholes on the, on the border of Pakistan or whatever. And so New Year's Eve was same thing, snow, foggy. And then January 5th, 07 was a crystal clear day. And we, so we fly and, and we get up there and, you know, the, or we fly right into, you know, an ambush, the, the helicopter catches on fire and, Jeez. and, um, he, wow. the pilot does a great job of, um, you know, doing a hard landing as they call it. And, and, uh, the fob we pile out and, um, the helicopter powers up and takes off and, Went back to Sadabad base where they counted eight bullet holes in the side. Um, and and the, the pilot had shut off the left engine. But the Jimmy McKnight, the captain, comes up to me and uh, grabs me by the um, body armor, like a football coach grabbing a face <laughs> mask. And said, sir, the last thing I need is a dead general in my fob. And, you know. <laughs> I was like, I love you too, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, no, it, it was, I'm like, I'm going to try to make you a happy man. Um, you know, that was his way of saying, you know, get, get underground somewhere and just stay yeah, there. Get safety. Um, um, but, uh, you know, when the helicopter powered up, the crew chief, had, he was standing on the ground with his ICS cord still on his helmet and they just powered up. He didn't have his weapon or anything. <laughs> he took my, my security guys Scooped up, you know, just literally it ripped the cord out of his helmet and he, he came in with us and uh, we were in the, in the uh, bunker there and it, were, it, it was pretty intense and uh, RPGs, machine gun fire everywhere is a three sided ambush and, and this uh, sergeant gets shot, uh, Sergeant Vile shot through the arm. He's a mortar ballistic computer guy and he, um, sits down right in front of me at a picnic table in this dugout that's uh, the the uh, uh, FOB HQ. And it's literally a dugout piece mm. of land that has some plywood with some sandbags on top of it. <laughs> and and Sergeant Vile is, you know, bleeding. His arm's just bleeding. He's tied off his own tourniquet. And um, I, I have um, immediately you know, went into the um, talk there, the op center, and I called for air, you know, what any good general would do is, uh, what's the one thing you can do uh, is call for air, air support. So mm-hmm. pretty soon we had two fresh Apaches, we had two A-10s, and we had a B-2 bomber. Oh, I love and, those. And, um, and McKnight looks at me and says, sir, you uh, you know, you can fight with me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Where's the battleship? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but anyway, Vial is, you know, starting to shake and going to shock and, um, you know, he's wounded. You know, he's shot through the arm. And, yeah. and um, I saw it, you know, I, I'd done my part. Uh, you know, now I was supposed to just stay out of the way, but I, I mess up and I go to the medic and I say, Hey, you might want to look at this guy because uh, you know the, everybody was fighting. Everybody had something going on. It was pretty mm-hmm. intense. And and the medic looks at me and says, "Sir, you don't know Sergeant Vile." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay. You know, he's your unit." And so he goes up and Sergeant Vile says, "You know, get the blank away from me." To, <laughs> to the medic uh, obviously uh, probably was the same thing to me. I don't approached him, but um, tough SOB. Uh, and he, you know, he's got the radio in his um, helmet there. Um, he's punching buttons with his good arm on the mortar ballistic computer. He's talking to the mortar that is just outside of the, uh, where we were at the op center. Um, and um, there's a, a forward spotter, uh, forward controller out there radioing to him, elevation and angle and azimuth and all of that. And the mortar's laying um, and... Um, the medic actually now of his own volition goes over there because he was starting to shake more and go into more shock. And he um, uh, says to the medic, I'll let you work on me when we get first round downrange. 
and and I'm like, where do we get these guys from? You know, <laughs> guy from Philadelphia, and he's just a great American. Mm-hmm. He's there thinking of his team. This is him. Yeah, this is his. You know, st- he steps into the batter's box, and you know, this is him. You know, staring down the the enemy pitcher, so to speak, and and um, he sucks it up, and yeah. he yeah. he calls in the the right numbers to the mortar you hear the mortar go off it's like you know an earthquake right outside and about a minute later all the hang time you hear the explosion and and, you know you just see him pull the radio out of his um uh, hig gear his chin strap and put it on the table he pushes everything um across the table to his assistant and he turns to the medic and says uh first round hit you can work on me now mm, wow and Damn. so i you know that's probably my proudest moment you know being there you know watching this sergeant and watching yeah. the guts the inner workings of a of a company headquarters um take on something they dealt with every single day in very mm. austere conditions and and i just feel blessed to have been um you know inside that and see that and give me an appreciation for what it is our, our young men and women do for us. Yeah, so. fighting for each other. Right. And mm-hmm. such exceptional people. And you could sit here for hours and tell us stories like that. Other yeah. people could come on and just regale us with one story after another that just made the rest of us just be in yeah. awe, basically. Yeah, man. I could listen to that so, all day. Pretty cool. Um, so we're going to totally change gears now, and we're going to jump into the lightning round. <laughs> here we go. So here we go. I am going to start it <laughs> off. I'm ready. You know, first thing that comes to mind. I'm, I'm going to have another drink. Hold on. Yeah, they always Work say up. that I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, question number one. A week in Sears or seven Halo jumps? A week in Sears? You know, survivor Se- school? Yeah, survivor school. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, seven Halo jumps. Uh, I'd much rather do that. You're rather much? Okay. Sounds like more fun <laughs> to me. I mean, that's fun. Why, why go get beat up and yell at it? <laughs> some, some, I've known a few people in the military that had to be uh, gently shoved out when they had to jump. So it's not always people's favorite thing to do. Uh, I, I loved uh, being a paratrooper. Awesome. So Nice. Um, okay, this one you might not like as much, but I've got to ask it. You want... <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm trying to do this with a straight face. I, I thought I wrote a brilliant question here. Do you want breakfast with Hillary Clinton or do you want lunch with Elizabeth Warren? <laughs> oh, um, well, hopefully Hillary Clinton hadn't spent that night. Um, <laughs> so I think I'll go with, with uh, lunch with Elizabeth Warren. So she's got so much energy, she might knock over all the drinks and everything. On that. <laughs> uh, that's a great uh, answer. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Your favorite president. Reagan. Reagan. Yeah, that seems to be he a common thing. He gave thing. me a 12% pay raise when I was there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Mm. Very practical reason. Goes a long way. <clears throat> this person would be a living person. Tony Tata would love to sit down and have a beer with who? Uh, well, all of you guys. Um, you well, go. yeah, I mean, that's the perfect answer. <laughs> we we um, will let you do that at some point soon. How's that? <laughs> you know, I... Um, I, you know, I love our author community and there's, um, still some authors that I, I, you know, I've met and don't know, um, all that well, you know, guys like, um, Lee Child or Michael Connolly. I'd love to grab it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So would we. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Connolly's definitely on my list too. Yeah. He's, he's one of our favorites for sure. Um, question five, would you surf the bonsai pipeline? Yeah, if it's like three feet, four feet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, low swell. You know, I, I've, surfed, I've surfed sunset and on the North Shore, and mm-hmm. um, that's that was uh, where I almost uh, lost lost it because uh, you know it said five to seven feet, and I said, okay, well that's definitely within my range, and mm-hmm. you know, this is like thirty years ago or whatever, and. And I paddle out, and all of a sudden it's like you know twelve to fifteen feet, which is a whole different ball game. And yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I catch a wave. I'm coming down the face of it, and thinking, okay, I got this. And then it was just too much to, to handle. And, you know, I didn't have wave. experience, and and I actually I actually thought, okay, well, this is a good way to go out. <laughs> <laughs> At the last second, I popped up, and uh, literally, I was underwater for about a minute. Jeez, oh, wow. good. 
yeah, it's like it a was, washing machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ragdoll it at the bottom of that thing, and the only way I found my way up was my leash. Um, was my okay. was tombstoning, uh, and and um, I crawled up my leash. Wow, wow. Jeez. Um, so we only get five questions. I do have a bonus question. All right. Dilly. Will you order Chris to drop and give me give twenty five? Dilly. <laughs> Yeah, Chris, drop and give me twenty-five. That's easy. Right, you're, right. you're probably oh. not going to see it. Come on, that's it. Come on. Right, he's going to do it. He's going to see how Mike's doing his questions. Yeah, he's just. He's out of camera, that. so we don't know if he's actually doing it or not. It, that yeah. question will lead into the introduction to our. You're our, not going deep enough, Chris. Somewhere. Let's go. So, I think he's just stretching. <laughs> yeah, I, he's, he's probably angry. laying down drinking. Actually, Chris, a, Chris is a pretty fit dude. He, yeah, he's probably he's at least probably actually doing it. All right, I'm back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> those one arm for you you clap you didn't clap between one them. arm <laughs> okay on. so right. next up we have mr mike for all right you. here we go all right <clears throat> you have to kill one <laughs> eric or chris <laughs> oh wow well, i just did push-ups <laughs> kill yeah. eric he can yeah. take that in consideration chris chris did push-ups so i'll kill eric if i'm going to be killed by anyone it's an honor to be killed by yes, you go. Absolutely. there you go Wow. All right. If you were a military aircraft, <laughs> which one would you be? Ooh, um, I like the A-10. Oh, I, oh, I love the A-10. A Everybody loves the A-10s. Yeah. All right. If you were the West Point Commandant, what would be the first thing that you change? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I would um, make the fourth class system um, – I think end at uh, Christmas time instead at the end of the year. Oh yeah, that's that's actually a fantastic. Situation. Wow, I didn't. Uh, <clears throat> that's awesome idea. His second choice was to put a lock on the water tower. <laughs> yeah, change the lock on the water tower. <laughs> no, take the lock off. Water tower available for sneaking. <laughs> in. Uh, uh. Uh, all right, you can have dinner with one deceased historical military leader. Who would that be? Oh wow. Um, I, I think Eisenhower. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I mean, uh, the, the – uh, no, re, let me change that. Jim Gavin, the, 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 his book, On to Berlin, and the, him uh, commanding the 505, the 82nd. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he, he was such a legendary figure in the paratroops. I thought it, it would be Gavin. Cool. Okay. All right. You and Nick Irving create a band. What's the name? Oh, the Reaper. I mean, <laughs> or send it. <laughs> or send it, yeah. Yes. Or the other, right? I like send it. That's cool. All right. The Reaper. Uh, okay, Chris, you're up, Chris. Right, I'm done. So, uh, General, you're about to go into battle. What song is playing in the background as you're going forward? Um, uh, Disturbs version of Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. Oh, that's like, dude, that's a fan so oh, that that was was fantastic, fantastic cover. Uh, that that's what you hear when they did it live. Covers. When he did yeah. it live, it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, now it sends chills up your spine. Okay. Yeah, nice. That um, hurt, hurt by Nine Inch Nails is not, I mean, by uh, Johnny Cash doing Johnny Nine Inch Cash. Nails. Oh, well, that was pretty good too. Yeah. So, uh, there was a, I know you said you didn't watch too much TV, but there was a TV show, uh, 90s Quantum Leap. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. So uh, you just quantum leaped into the body of one of the castaways on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> but you get to pick who. Whose body did you leap into? Ginger. Ginger. Uh, <laughs> ginger. ginger. God, it's got to be Thurston Hell the Third. Yeah, there you go. All right. You know, crawl up his yacht, you know, and I can take my cell phone with me. Again. Uh, Eric would have picked Ginger. Just, yeah. Just because. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice looking. <laughs> All right, so next, so the next three questions I have are are true and false, and and, and uh, you've spent um, a fair amount of time in North Carolina, so it, these have to do with North Carolina laws. True or false? Happy hour is illegal in North Carolina. Ooh. Well, if it is, I I broke it every day. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go with true. It is true. Happy hour is illegal in North Carolina. Wow. True or false? Next one. Bingo games in North Carolina cannot last more than five hours. I'm going to say true. 
That is also true. Wow. Yeah, you, you, five hours, you're done. If you're not, you're Bunch going of kill joys. All right. <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you can't drink and you can't play bingo for Oh, man, I'm moving, man. <laughs> so grandma's not getting lit up in bingo. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, continuing uh, with the booze theme, my, my parents will enjoy that. Mom. Mm, yeah, mom. Uh, in North Carolina, is it true or false that you can get a DWI while riding on a horse? I would say that's true. Definitely true. You're riding on a horse it. and you three, are lit three, up. Three for you get, three. You yeah, there you go. Yeah. Don't it. ride your horse to bingo while you're drinking. <laughs> while you're drinking. <laughs> I love North Carolina, by the way. Yeah. During happy hour. I'm <laughs> During right happy now. hour. During right. non happy hour. Right? <laughs> okay, my, my first lightning round question is, what's the best mess hall you've ever been to in the military? Oh, wow. Uh, it's got to be a Navy one somewhere. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, my, my brother was the... Um, XO of a ship, and uh, when he when he was a lieutenant, the USS Glover was in port at uh, Norfolk, and we would go on during Thanksgiving because we're from Virginia Beach, and so he would he would always take duty on Thanksgiving Day, so his peers could go home and see their families, and we would eat on the ship, and you're treated like a king. So that's the best mess oh, I've right. had mm-hmm. anywhere far none. Nice After that, it would be some Air Force base somewhere. Yep. Okay. <laughs> now, um, th- what is the best officer portrayal on film? Officer portrayal on like, film. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see what what's a good movie I've seen lately on, on. And it can be this can be in history as far as you're concerned. Um, you know, I I think um, Patton. Uh, you know, George uh, C. Scott and Patton is kind of the quintessential. Mm, that was well, mine. It's tough to beat that one. Yeah, yeah. I love that movie. Love I think I think actor. I think Peck nailed MacArthur too. Now that you brought that up, actually, when I think about it. But um, <clears throat> so, what's the best weapons upgrade since you've been in the military? Weapons or equipment upgrade, I should say. Well, the the best equipment upgrade was the sleeping bag. Um, it used to have this cotton down thing from World War II that was terrible. And I can remember freezing in a rice paddy in Korea uh, when we were doing some operations along the border there. And finally, we got something that would actually keep you warm when you were in extreme hmm. environments. Um, the best uh, weapons upgrade, um, I think, uh, is the javelin uh, for um you know, anti-armor defense Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, the squad automatic weapon was a good up weapon that, you know, today won't think it's a weapons upgrade, but, uh, we went from just having the M 16 to, to the M four and also having the squad automatic weapon. That was a great upgrade for infantry. Yeah. And like lugging a 30 cal around. (laughs) Now the boy, the boys at DARPA are working on all sorts of stuff all the time. So if you could invent, a weapons upgrade, what would it be? Like what's, what's the next great weapons upgrade that's needed? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, it's, it's on the way actually. I, I think that what, where we're going to be here shortly is where we have drones flying out in front of our troops and, and uh, shooting uh, at, at the enemy over the hill. Right. And, and to me, that's, that's probably the next leap in warfare. Um, and, and uh, being able to dominate the near airspace yeah. uh, so that, uh, you know, having air supremacy is great and, and it's always uh, helpful for that. But when you're in uh, close quarters combat, moving from house to house or hill to hill, uh, sometimes it's hard to, to vector in that uh, air support uh, to give you the help you need. And yeah. so we have the capability now to have drones that can, that can go, you know, one building over or one hill over. Okay, I call, those, last, the, I call those the angels of death. Angels of death. They are. My, yeah. my last question, it's a karaoke night at the author army mess hall, uh, army author mess hall. What is uh, General Tata singing? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not. That's the problem. <laughs> um, so, a word to sing. <laughs> um, wow, what am I singing? So, I, I, um, <laughs> You stumped them. I, I it would probably be little bow wow basketball. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it would. 
And let's let's see. Well, let's he's check no the Vegas odds on that. He dropped the lil. He actually dropped the bow wow too. Um, My head hurts. I can't believe that was the answer. <laughs> So next thriller mm. fest, we all need to go drinking, and I know we're gonna yeah. karaoke two blocks over, so That's we got fantastic. it. We gotta get that song on the list. Yeah, oh that or sort of mix a lot. Come on, you know. That's sure. <laughs> hey, can can we ask one more question before we go here? Uh, maybe sure. he has an answer, maybe he does. I don't know. But um, General, who do you think is the greatest rock band from Canada? <laughs> I don't know. Is that ABBA? You know, who's from Canada? So. <laughs> Close enough. Well, Close well, enough. We yeah. like, uh, yeah. I will say Rush. Yeah, we we'll like right. Rush. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Inside joke. Oh, yeah. That was an inside joke. <laughs> well, Tony, thank you for your time. You survived our lightning round. Um, it was an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, I know, and a lot of fun. Lot of we fun. look forward to catching up with you again soon. You're welcome to come on anytime you'd like. Yeah, anytime. Uh, anybody going to be at BoucherCon? Sadly, not this year, but no. next year and everything else. We, gotcha. This is probably the last major... Um, author event that we won't have a presence at some way, shape, or form. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, you guys are doing a great job. We are sending a correspondent, though. That's we'll true. Have, we'll have feet on the ground. Lori That's Chandler right. will be there. Yep. Yes. And uh, Double double Crossfire hits the stores uh, Monday, right? Next Tuesday. 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 Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Everywhere. Book, book number 12. I can't believe it. Yeah. Wow. Quite that went like fast. That. Holy smokes. Nice. But, I mean, he, you've been writing your – I mean, we talked earlier. You've been writing your whole uh, – your whole life yeah 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 no I, it's um it's exciting um and i just you know i love to write and create and it's um i'm very fortunate that i've got uh, publishers like kinzenden and sam martin's press that um put my stuff out there nice Amen. well Amen. given what you said earlier about how important your time is and how you how you think twice before you you give it to somebody we really appreciate you giving us this yeah for sure likewise for you guys everybody's got them I mean, got time and family and all that so thank you for uh, spending time with me as well sure well, you bet get, get your thousand words in today general if not do it tonight and yeah no i'm gonna do it right now absolutely I'll enjoy <laughs> it so all right guys take care so we're, we're gonna you salute to you tony appreciate it salute <laughs> 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 you to tony tater for coming on the crew reviews podcast today if you would like to get a copy of tony's new book double crossfire please leave a comment and like our podcast and we one winner will win a copy of this book it is available coming out on october 29th and we look forward to seeing you soon with our next guest on monday salute boys cheers all right have a good one Pretty cool. I love it. You're wearing the camo. I got the yeah. I got sure, the, the flag on. There we go. He's wearing West Point. What are you? What are you wearing there? A button up shirt. I'm wearing a nice button down blue shirt that you know Coast Guard looks blues. professional. <laughs> Coast Guard blues. <laughs> do whatever the hell you want, but I'm gonna do what I want, boy. Well, I can flip it back. Yeah. Well, you Man. Can flip it. Good luck. Go. <laughs> Good luck. Go. I'm gonna try to mess you up. Here it comes. A little bit. So I'm going to go with you fail the first time. There's a lot of, there's a lot of words here. Count me down. 7, 12, <laughs> 13, hike. Thank you to Tony Tata for coming on the Crew Reviews podcast today. And his Start new book. Start over. That was awful. So you're, dude. That was awful. You're like low energy. <laughs> Who was the low energy guy in the campaign? <laughs> I'll tell you about the sausage game that we play every now and then. Oh my gosh, dude, that's an holy cr- tonight is retired Brigadier General Anthony <laughs> Tata. I'm done. Go ahead, go on, go on. Yeah, we love it. It's not like a head injury case here. <laughs> All right, you gonna do your What'd outro? You get that microphone for? It's like I don't know what you're gonna do to it when you do that. You're like, yeah, I know what I'm gonna do with the volume. Yeah, nobody was ready for that toast. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I was I was reading Facebook. Do it again. Like Facebook and he's just Do it again. At the I thought as soon as I was done talking, like it was done. I wasn't like so. I know. What, what? I know. Eric went back into freeze mode. Where <laughs> <laughs> freeze mode? <laughs> like I do the whole thing again, or just part of it again? High energy problem though. Um, nope. Glare. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, but I can't hold forward. it down like that to kill the glare. No, just a hold it bit. down. Hold just it down. Look. That looks stupid.
Oh, no, not the book. Can't no. See it. Uh, no. Perfect. Right. <laughs> Right Hold it. If you'd like answer. to win a copy of this book, please like our podcast on YouTube or Podbeam or iTunes or God knows what else we're on right now. Drugs. I'm not redoing. I it. guess we're getting outtakes for this one. <laughs> that's all I've been looking for the whole time. That's what, yeah, that's why you're making me be an ass. So you can put it on the back of the show. Hey, I don't have to ass. make you do that. You yes. I just that have to let the camera free roll. free will. See, this yeah. is the energy we need, Eric. Yeah, Do see, it. finally. I'm a wasting it all now, and it's going to be done. I'm going to hit my wall in like five. I'm hitting my non-liquor wall in like two seconds. Oh, no, man. Really? Toasted we with water, toasted remember? all of them. See, you don't even watch the show. That's just how non-committal you are. I no, watch the beginning and the end. <laughs> <laughs> I watch for the bloopers at the end. So Great. Now one side of you is and? blotted out and the other side. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I hope you're recording. <laughs> oh, he is. He is. I learned my lesson long ago. Oh, Never there you stop. go. There you go. There that one it doesn't is. have a glare? Well, it's a great oh. because we can't see you, which is beneficial, and we can see the book, which is no, beneficial. No, no, no. Move, so it to, no. move it to your left a little bit. Hold it up. Hold it up. Up. Yeah, I know. Up. You want him to go right there. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. <laughs>